you're living differently from the world uh, around you. It can be lonely and isolating. It's been very good to have Tommy as a as a friend as we kind of digest and mostly just make fun of ourselves and not take ourselves too seriously, but make fun of each other. All right. Welcome back to the Till and Keep podcast. My name is Jason Craig. Uh, like many other podcasts that uh, talk with their friends and buddies about things, they talk about the intersection of this and that. We are usually talking about the intersection of culture and work and economy and household and all of these things, uh, particularly thinking about uh, parents uh, and and fathers that have to deal with the realities of life. You know, the question of whether or not to bring in technology to the home, the question of how they're going to pay for this and that, how much is too much for this, how much time should be allotted to that. Uh, and a lot of us, uh, as we've discussed with other guests on the podcast, have um, actually wanted to limit our choices and limit what we're going to do uh, by making our work harder. Um, so uh, we've, we've done that by choosing to embrace uh, either a homesteading life or a farming life. Uh, and if we haven't discussed it before, if you're wondering why those were, why I use those words um, for different situations, they're not quite interchangeable. Homesteading would refer to what we might call subsistence farming or just uh, the reality of growing food on uh, for the sake of your family. That's the, the primary purpose. So you would think, or, or providing for the direct needs of your family uh, by your direct labor, your direct work. So homesteading would refer to uh, your backyard chickens, uh, your vegetable garden, your bees. Um, uh, and then it really we could, in that category, we might want to include even, even hunting uh, and then some of the, the crafts around uh, splitting wood. Or I think we would even include the ability to fix and build your own home would really be under homestead because it's not just about food, but actually just meeting the practical needs of your family through your direct work with your family for that purpose, instead of having the intermediary uh, use of money to either purchase the thing that you need or purchase the service that you need. Then the other, on the other hand, there's farming, which is where you do that kind of stuff, but people pay you to do it. Um, and it can be, sometimes those things seem like they go together, but sometimes actually they can be a challenge. Uh, and that's what I want to talk about. In today's podcast, I have my friend Tommy Van Horn. Uh, those of you who have might have seen uh, the upcoming book from Tan called Liturgy of the Land, uh, this is my friend uh, that we wrote the book together and um, completely equal, right, Tommy? And um, <laughs> Tommy's actually integral to, to my own um, understanding and, and, and tussling and wrestling with the ideas of homesteading and farming and work uh, because we, we worked together uh, at the Apostolate Fraternus, and uh, probably about 12 years ago, both of us were having that that agrarian conversion that we talk about on the podcast of um, wanting to integrate our our household and our work a little bit more in our local economy and our community. And and um, I took the route of um, continuing work with Fraternus, continuing work through phones and computers uh, while homesteading on the side, and. Um, Although now we have a, a small commercial dairy, I still uh, am on the scale of, of primarily homesteading. Tommy, on the other hand, went more towards farming, although we'll talk about the route he took uh, through retail and, and B words like boutique stuff. Um, and uh, and he left me behind a fraternist cruelly in the cold to uh, to pursue his extremely lucrative and uh, uh relaxing career of beekeeping um but we all we wrote we wrote the book together because we uh, interestingly it, it has been a fruitful friendship i don't know if if i didn't have someone to constantly talk with and bounce ideas off of sometimes the when you're living differently from the world uh around you it can be lonely and isolating it's been very good to have tommy as a as a friend as we kind of digest and mostly just make fun of ourselves and not take ourselves too seriously, but make fun of each other in our attempts to do what we're doing. Um, but both of us are coming from the outside of the homestead inward and trying to figure it all out. Um, and uh, But interestingly, we took the route of dairy. Tommy took the route of the bees. So we've got the lands of milk and honey between our, our homesteads. And uh, uh, Tommy now lives in Florida, so we're not in the same area, although 
he threatens me once a year with moving here, but he never has. And I don't know if he ever will. Anyway, Tommy, welcome to the Till and Keith podcast. Um, Next. I would first, let's just go ahead and start back at the story. Um, you, I, I, I don't know if the, uh, 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 if the why or the what was, uh, what you were going to do was happening first. Uh, we had Craig DeFaro on the podcast and he was, his desire for uh, being active led him to gardening and then gardening led him to wanting to do more at homestead. And that kind of led him towards now he's a butcher um, for you. Was it more of the theoretical of, uh, or tell me about the beginning of your story. Was it the theoretical thought of uh, you and I discussing farming or was it some sort of experience you were having? I know cause you were starting to dabble in bees. Yeah, it's a good question. Thanks for having me, Jason. Uh, it's always good to talk. Um, yeah, it's uh, it was. I would say it's kind of bo- both. I, this was happening. So I, I was married in 2010. We had our first child in 2011, and it was kind of a, a series of events coming together where uh, seeing myself as a father and not just as a husband or as a as a, an individual. You know, and uh, it kind of took on a whole new perspective of of. Uh, understanding of who I was and my duty of state um, and this desire to be work, not just for the family, but with the family was also kind of beginning to well up uh, during that time. Kind of, uh, I read a really short book called, by Stetson on successful fathers. I mean, it's like super short, pretty, you know, uh, elementary and thought, but it, it was enough to kind of jumpstart this idea of, I need to bring some sort, uh, some aspect of economy back into the home, and not just be a place of consumption. Um, right. Because, well, you're actually. I think that. Yeah, that was the book because you and I read that. I think at the same time, and that was right. the first time I had really come to understand that. Oh, because we were working with fraternists, and we were asking, why do we have right. to be so intentional with the formation of young men? Why is it going so poorly today? And the right. stent, his answer, Stetson, was because we're not working on farms anymore. Uh, that yep. once we lost that, that hasn't been replaced. And I mean, that was his proposal was not agrarianism. He was just observing this fact. So that, I For think sure. that was the main point. Yeah. The, and it, or, or, or the family business or the butcher shop or the wood shop or whatever it is. Yeah. So, um, so that was kind of happening. Our conversations were happening, witnessing this experience within fraternists. Uh, and it's like, yeah, we have to create this, you know, not machine, but like this program and it's good. And what's coming of it is good, but it's like this kind of happened organically. It seemed, at least in in times past, uh, prior to certain revolutions or revolts. Um, and uh, the, the the second piece of the equation was uh, I, I had a friend of a friend driving across country with his bees in the back of his car, like any faithful <laughs> crazy beekeeper. They were inside his sedan, got kind of cooped up, and he swerved to miss a semi truck just outside of Pensacola where I was living. And the whole the whole hive toppled over. The guy was covered in bees. So he called up Frank Raleigh, who was a fraternist captain. And Frank, kind of with those bees, knew I was interested in just the outdoors, got me, you know, uh, into the beekeeping scene. And I was just instantly hooked. I just I couldn't believe what you know you open a hive like just the complexities yet the simplicity of what's going on and within a period of time i guess it was 2000 late 2011 so by late 2012 early 2013 i had abandoned jason at fraternus and uh (laughs) went full time into the honey scene uh producing some honey but also aggregating honey from other commercial beekeepers in the area and selling honey under one label um, that was all sourced locally and just started selling honey to grocery stores online, doing the farmer's market hustle, uh, kind of running crazy, but it was exhilarating and exciting. And we were kind of working together and kind of just, you know, at the same time running ourselves into the ground because I didn't know what I was doing half the time, but it was, it was sticking and it was, uh, there was momentum and things began to kind of level off as we got further into it. Uh, so that's kind of yeah the intro of how I got into the whole yeah. the whole thing. I don't want yeah I don't want to skip um, you know a lot of the stories that uh, so far asking people on the podcast it's it's kind of the same story over and over again which is I want to work and be with my family 
Uh, except yeah. when I'm on a podcast. What do you? I see someone on your webcam. What are you doing there? There's a you child. Um, hey, go hang with mama. Um, hey, beautiful. She can't hear me. I'm talking, Mister Green. Go out there. Shut the um, it's not the. Um, it's kind of the same story over and over again, which is a which is a father yeah. wants to work with his family. Um, and yeah. so, I mean, how many kids do you guys have now? We have four. We have four. Yeah. Um, so the the question then I'd like to ask you though is I know that you 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 mentioned running ragged. Um, mm. You and I there, I there there's been times I remember when we were we had our yogurt business and I was like milk is on Saturdays. Um, and so I had my, you know, the day job and then we're farming, we're dairy farming on the side, which is, there's no such thing as, you know, part-time dairy. And, um, right. although it is part-time, but then, you know, I was getting up at like 4am to milk and then load the coolers and drive to Asheville to the farmer's market. And, and, yeah. uh, you know, we've really, we've really had to scale back so that mm -hmm. we can, you know, bring, um, because that, yeah, it was integrated when, but then I was actually, I really was gone. Um, even more, not less. Yeah. So there's sometimes we we romanticize farming or homesteading, uh, not right. realizing what we've done. Can you? What's been your experience though? Because um, you know, you and I both were also, and I mean, I guess still, I just haven't talked to him. While friends with Kevin Ford, who was running the Catholic Land Movement blog back then, and yeah. you know, he he in a lot of in an yeah. interview I I saw or read or talked to him. I don't remember when he said it, but he said, you know, if you want a homestead, don't start a market garden which is yeah. if you want to be homesteading, don't uh, farm. So you now, I would say you're probably homesteading now more than you have since you started the bee thing. Cause you kind of went backwards from retailing honey into growing more bees. Uh, Cause right. now you're, you're a commercial, you're a wholesaler more than a retailer. Although we, we can talk about the candle business that you're revving up now, but um, yeah. Yeah, no, it's, what's that's been your really experience good... now that you're homesteading more? Now that you're homesteading more, because when I because when we we departed, I might have homesteaded more than you were more, I guess, farming. If you're going to talk about making money from an agricultural yeah. product, um, what what, yeah. what what's your like thoughts or experience about you know being making your money from farming uh, versus really focusing on you know the integration of your homestead? Yeah, no, it's a really good point because you're you're to make it in a small business. I read it in some book. It's like the riches are in the niches and you can't compete with Walmart. You're not trying to compete with, you know, Kroger or Publix or whoever. So you got to do something really well and you got to provide, you know, provide it in a way that is unique and can't be found anywhere else is what is, is the way we kind of, uh, I guess, segmented ourselves into the marketplace. But to do that, it takes a ton of energy to market the product, to make sure it's a good quality product. Um, and then you have all, you know, your taxes, all the things with small, you know, self-employment and small business, you're, you're kind of like a one man, you know, wearing multiple hats. Um, and so it's, yeah, it's running a business. It's really running a business that is land-based, which is even trickier because you got weather to contend with in ways that, you know, you wouldn't otherwise. So yeah, it's, we, we had to, in 2020, we had an opportunity to, to simplify the business model. We sold off the retail brand and we just became a bulk producer like you mentioned where we sell honey primarily we sell to our neighbor you know uh, a little roadside stand but other than that i'm not driving to farmers markets i'm not driving to grocery stores um and we're, we, we make enough honey to sell it in uh, a larger quantity like 55 gallons at a time to people who all they do is pack honey i mean it's there's some level of I guess internal struggle with that, uh, but because of the dream is to do it all, but it's really hard to do it all. I mean, our, our children are age five to 12. And I would say in the last four years, Gabriel, my son has been really a part of the beekeeping thing. But prior to that, when there, we have a lot of little children, it was exhausting because you know my wife is busy with the children. I'm trying to run the business, trying to also be present to them. But the reality is we weren't all doing it together. I mean, it's, uh, but whereas the homesteading thing, you can, if you, you know, trash the carrots because you forgot to, you know, mulch them, it's not going to like crash your, you know, family budget. Uh, I mean, it does help offset it, but it's not like this end of the world where so you can make, there's a little more leeway for mistakes and for children to be involved, I think, 
on a homesteading level and it's a great place to learn and dabble in different things and maybe you know maybe you take something to market eventually through that experience uh, you find you really love just cut flowers or whatever it is you know and uh but it's it's definitely a different it did you know a lot of i used to be in the surfing scene and a lot of the guys that would compete say that competing would take the joy out of surfing and they just want to be like a so-called soul surfer um you know just go free <laughs> surfing and there's something to that though like when you have to make money when you got to perform when you got to it's got to be you know your a plus effort every time uh it's just a different it's a different ball of wax you know no pun intended but it is and it's just uh so it's you know do i love beekeeping do i love the the seasonality of it and, and the physical exertion and the the trial and the struggle and the and the triumph and all of it yeah absolutely but it's uh it's become easier though as the children have gotten older it was it was it was crazy you know those in those early yeah. years for sure I, I can see the um, we have a webcam here those are listening time he's got the shock in his eyes remembering uh manic mondays you guys called it the day after the markets and That's um, right. the um well i guess uh to, to continue to drill down into the question though I, i've also it's been interesting as you and i began i think because of probably our formation our growing up like the way you think about things is how am i going to make money from this and yeah. there's absolutely uh a need you you have to provide i mean there's just bills to pay you're not a i mean the only person yeah. or not the person i know who, cash. Has, who has escaped yeah. uh the the need for money the most would be uh jim curley who's been on the podcast um and we yeah. talk about him a lot because because he lives so simply and, and and but a lot of us you know whether it's our standards or our, or our need or legitimate needs or existing debts or whatever we got to make money but Right. the um farming you know and i think a lot of people start when they're dreaming it up is how am i going to make money doing something i've never done before uh which is mm. a big challenge that you know you live through but also yeah. i think it, learning how to homestead is um learning to uh eat what you can sell instead of sell what you can eat and sort of starting there uh and i've just yeah I've, more and more I, I guess i've stopped thinking of ways that i can I monetize the things I'm uh, I'm growing, uh, and there's right. actually been a liberation, and actually financially has made more sense for us. Um, hmm. So you know we're we're milking six cows, and like I'm realizing if we you know we have you know there's ten people in our house, we have eight kids, and if we make all hmm. the cheese and butter and kefir and ghee and ice cream we can, then we've really we've offset a lot plus eating the you know the beef. So I guess my yeah. question is now how is it you know, how's it going? So in case anybody missed what Tommy saw, he was bottling honey and retailing it is pr primarily is a, is a re is a marketing retail and sales job with and then you were doing some beekeeping to kind of supplement and now you're you're on the other end of that supply which is you're growing you're you have a lot more hives you're selling in bulk and you're wholesaling mm -hmm. it so that you're making less money per pound of honey but it gives you more time to just focus on actually growing yeah. bees and I know yeah. that you've expanded more into homesteading. I know you've had more pigs and more, and you've had a milk yeah. cow and such. Is that yeah. is that something you're maturing because your kids are getting older, or you've just kind of altered how you think about what you're doing on the land? Well, it was kind of a both. It was kind of a, a situation where I didn't have. I started the business with five thousand um, dollars, and I back in 2011, 2012. And to to be able to make a living with just bee colonies and selling bulk, you got to have somewhere on the order of six to seven hundred colonies in this part of the world, anyway. And that takes a lot of capital. You know, you're talking several hundred thousand dollars of infrastructure and equipment. So I kind of started with what I I had. I had a little niche. I knew some people that would sell me honey, and I started to expand the bee thing. Um, and I guess now that I'm, I've, I've, we expanded the bee thing to a point where I was running bees full time and marketing honey full time and working two full time jobs. Now getting rid of the marketing side of the business, yeah, it's the way of life is it's actually more tied to the land than I was. I mean, we have an off season; it's slower in the fall and the winter. Uh, it's crazy in the spring, but I'm not trying to also keep up with other accounts. So the way of life as a family is substantially improved, um, and it's it's definitely like you've kind of mentioned yeah it's allowed more time to homestead i mean we just slaughtered one of our 
our pigs, um, our cows about due any day where we'll be back in milk again. We, we, we seasonally milk. We only have one milk cow. So we get nine, nine months of milk, eight months of milk, and then we're off. We get a nice off season, which I don't think I could ever be a full-time dairy, but, uh, um, yeah, it's, it's just, uh, the rhythm of life is more sustainable now that we kind of ebb and flow with the seasons. Uh, we, you know, we homeschool, we, homeschool during the busy season when I'm busy and then we're all off together in the fall, which is really nice. Cause then we can, you know, wake up at eight o'clock in the morning, you know, and go do the a few farm chores we have and kind of a little bit of the woodworking I need to do. And I mean, it's not like that every day, but it's definitely, it's right. noticeably slower in November, December, and January. So, um, yeah, so that's yeah now that a lot of people like, like me, um, so dairying works well for me because I have a full-time job and it just, yeah. it, it, it works within the industrial model, which is just, you know, nine to five, whatever, but because I'm out, because I can work from home, uh, like a lot of people, I can make that work. So dairy farming for me, it's sort of unending, but we don't have uh, the seasonality. I mean, we kind mm. of like it day in and day out do it's more of a, I mean, it, which can be bad. It can seem like a machine, but actually for us, it is more, um uh, monastic i guess it's just our you know milking yeah. every day is just just what we're going to do but it it i mm -hmm. guess it does have changes with grass and weather and um you know uh all of that but you, what you're and so a lot of people do that they make it work with that so your homesteading like a lot of people is supplemental to your job your work right. your small business which is beekeeping but the nature of it because it is agricultural the, the that's an interesting like you have an entire season uh, instead of mm -hmm. scheduling a vacation, um, you know, it's like you kind of have a season when you're available, uh, which is. Yeah. Yeah. We, we pretty much from like what. Right. No, it is. I mean, we're forced to like say no to family vacations and travel as much as I got. There's a pilgrimage every spring I would love to do, but I can never do it <laughs> because it's just, yeah. it's absolutely insane in April around Easter. I mean, I can, you know, squeak out the time around the tritium, but it's tough to go any anywhere really. Um, but you know, October, November, December, I'm like calling Jason up for looking for something to do, you know, yeah. uh, <laughs> let's go, have a, let's have a conference. That's for, which by the way, we're, uh, my, my sons are completely, so Henry did shoot his deer, uh, on the property this year, his first one, but, uh, next year they're all just banking on, um, going with you to your, uh, wherever you That'd go. Be great. Cause yeah. Gabe was bragging yeah. about all his books um so um all right so you and i both of us i mean we we're coming from um uh completely different backgrounds but both of them are not farming i mean this is something that that's you right. to learn i know you had uh, i mean you're from uh the woodlands in texas which is a fairly massive sprawling uh utopia um, <laughs> suburb <Yeah. laughs> yeah. I'm um and no, um, but um, you, your your wife's also um, uh, you know she is not from any kind of farming or background like mine. So um, how has uh, the change from you know the the full retail to more homesteading? How has that affected her and you know, sort of her sense of uh, uh, you know being integrated with your work, managing the home, and that sort of thing? Yeah, I mean it's it's become more, there's more, more of a rhythm. I mean, it was just always like, just go, 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 go was the, cause it's like yeah. when the bee things slowed down in the winter time, when we were retailing honey, retail sales would just go through the roof in November and December during, you know, Thanksgiving and Christmas. So there was never a slow time. So she, you know, she, I think appreciates the rhythm of the, of the season, seasonal work a lot more. And, um, I mean, the reality is, you know, she's not out in the bee yard with me, but my work really does affect, you know, the, the rhythm of the family when we eat dinner, when we don't, you know, if I'm moving bees at nighttime, okay, we're doing the rosary and during the middle of the day and, you know, eating an early dinner and then, you know, Gabriel and I are going to go move bees at, at around sunset. So it, everything kind of flows, uh, the, the family schedule shifts a bit, you know, based on what, the, what the bees need, you know, during that time of the year. But it is nice to be able to turn it off for several months and the family is is always the priority at that point i mean the family is always a priority but it's just it shifts with the demands of the work uh as far as um, right. the time allocation so 
but yeah, I mean, it's uh, as, as the girls are. I mean, that was part of the reason. I guess we have this stockpile of beeswax, and we have all we have three girls and one boy, and they and they do they want to make a little bit of money that you know our oldest wants to buy a horse. I'm like, well, you got to feed the horse. <laughs> So the yeah. candle idea was kind of was kind of like that was this idea of selling candles. But I'm like, I'm not going to be peddling candles like you know, everywhere. And if we're going to do it, I just want to have a simple marketing strategy and just, you know, we're just going to do it online. So so that that's kind of as the, you know, the children are getting older and the, with more girls, we're, we're letting them kind of, you know, take a bigger part in that. So, um, yeah. So tell me that's yeah. so that's uh, um, you're the new. So. You went you went into retail, backed into farming via retail, went into wholesaling, and now you have this stockpile of of beeswax. So now you're making 100 percent beeswax candles. It's called what's it ambrosian candles? Yeah, ambrosiancandles.com. Mm -hmm. Oh yeah. man, and nice plug. Good job. <laughs> so yeah, go. I saw an ad you had the other day, which just cracked, and I've been repeating it to people. Uh atheists use paraffin, Catholics use wax. Uh, so you're selling candles and you're clearly, you know, um, I think, I mean, yeah. the, the story behind them of that, you know, these are, these are hundred percent beeswax candles from a Catholic family that loves the bees, love, the, you know, it's a, it's just, it's like a no brainer. Uh, and it's also interesting because it's one of those areas where I think those of us that are wanting to homestead and live in this way of life, you know, we want the local economy, but sometimes, right. I mean, you know, the right. people who buy the worst food, uh, and, right. and eat with, with without care are often out in the rural area. So it's not as if I'm surrounded yeah. by, um, you know, no. customers that want high quality. So the internet provides this strange, uh, you know, ability to, to retail that. Uh, yeah. But the, the more interesting thing though, is you're now, instead of um, forcing uh, your family that into this new way of life when you're retailing is actually, this is growing. I mean, for what I can observe, it seems like it's growing from the available labor and the desire to be a part of it, which is um, your girls. And then, um, you know, the, the mountains of wax you're building up. Um, right. So is that, is that something that they're, is that, I know that, I know that Gabe is like at your, Gabriel, your son, your, your, your own, yeah, we have one kid, one son uh, is always yeah. at your side, basically moving bee boxes. My, my kids always talk about like, he's the strongest, uh, <laughs> however old he is, nine year old, 10 year old they've ever met from yeah. just moving, you know, He's constantly with you. Um, yeah. But then, so is this sort of, is this something that the girls have um, embraced and, and taken on or did you just set them to work to do it? Yeah. I mean, it's, it's always been kind of a conversation. I mean, they, we, we've always made our own candles for, well, I say always in the last, you know, five to, to eight years, we've started making candles for ourselves and for um, just our prayer, prayer altar and for the uh, Advent candles and then we started making some for friends and then for the chapel uh and where, where we attend mass and so it's 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 kind of been a natural progression you know and it yeah it's really i mean emily has definitely been the creative mind behind all of it like with the which candles and this or that or you know gift packaging concepts and all that um, and she kind of kind of creates the system, the idea, but she's just, you know, busy homeschooling and being a mother and a wife. So she's not necessarily always in there pouring candles, but the girls help. And then we have a couple of girls from that attend uh, that go to mass with us and they help us as well. They're they're 15, 16, so they're a little older, but it's just been a nice dynamic to have that, you know, that mentorship there where they kind of look up to these older girls and they're a part of that. And then, yeah, Gabriel's just he's literally, yeah, I, I think if he didn't have to do another day of school. He'd be perfectly fine and just, you know, be out there uh, and <laughs> in, in the Bobcat or moving bees or whatever. Um, yeah. But, well, I, I highly recommend, uh, I did an interview on the podcast with uh, Jordan Almanzar who wrote uh, when the earth was flat and he just describes his, he got, he was homeschooled like in the late eighties and nineties, I think. And uh, basically oh, wow. unschooled and it was, and now he's a scholar and he's, everyone's just worried too much. Just let your boys have adventure. Really? be dangerous. And oh, oh, it was great. You'll, you'll like it um what's the what's the that, name of that that's again? uh uh it's when the earth was flat jordan Alvarez. Okay. we sent it out to some <clears throat> spade guild subscribers but um so the uh the same thing is happening with us i mean i think one encouragement and in, in, in the story as you're talking i'm reflecting is that um a lot of people want to create the culture of an integrated home and a homestead really quick 
And I'm yeah. just, I almost feel like yeah. we're just getting there. Uh, you know, 12 years yeah. in, we're just sort of realizing what our, our order and our culture can look like. And the way I know that I know. is that, um, and, it, and it did help because you and I both, the, the good thing is uh, that our, our kids were young when we started. But now yeah. when I was first running spreadsheets endlessly about how to make a killing from, you know, six dairy cows and uh, uh, it was, you know, cheese. It was like, we're going to make so much money making this boutique cheese. We're going to retail. But the reality of what that would take to make that happen would not fit with our, our homeschooling and my other yeah. work. Yeah. Um, but now... My daughter, you know, Mary Mary's 14 is, yeah. um, you know, she's making cheese, but she's making it for the home and she yeah. has more interest in it. She's reading all these books and it went from, you know, how cheese is made to the history of cheese to now it's like, well, she's reading one on, you know, running a small cheese business. And, you know, that she huh. has the, the the possibility of that continuing. Yeah. Um, yeah. I, I had to come to peace with like, you know, I don't have to legitimize everything um, with, uh, a profitability and monetarily, but that I do need to focus on the culture of the family. And if our work is really providing for us directly, I guess that's how I know when we're doing it and directly, um, with our local community, it's an, yeah. for another podcast, but we stopped retailing yogurt, not only because our barn burned down, but because COVID made me realize that I was driving all over Western North Carolina to sell boutique yogurt. And I, I, could, I wasn't even selling milk to my neighbors who wanted it. So that's another yeah, story. Yeah. Um, yeah. But it sounds no, there's, like there's, you guys are, are uh, sorry, that are, you know, that that's maturing now that you're actually kind of having the next generation step in and having their own initiative. Yeah, for sure. And I, I you know, I, I think it's, I think you made a really good point that starting creating the culture, the homesteading culture or the, the farming culture at a young age is, is really important because it's hard to step into that. I see we have several friends that have moved out this way. And their their kids are older, and their kids are still their lives are still in town, and they have no interest to make cheese from the family cow or to kill a pig or to anything. I mean, they just they just want to be uh, their little their lives are in town, and understandably, I mean, they have the little league, they have the the ballet, the dance, all this different stuff, the swim team. Um, but I think there's something to it, like the struggle of you know just being in it, maybe not to a. Uh, you know, small business scale, but just homesteading and taking on that, that challenge uh, at a young age. But then, you know, as you're seeing, and I'm starting to see the children are starting to take ownership. I mean, Gabriel said, well, instead of paying me, can you just give me 32 hives this year? And so I can make my own honey and sell <laughs> it. And I mean, he'll make more money that way. <laughs> and uh, yeah. I'm like, absolutely. Absolutely. I'd love to do that and not to pay taxes. Um, and uh, <laughs> so, you know, but he's, he's got this, this vision for his, his, you know, the next several years of his life, he wants to save money for this or that. Um, mm -hmm. And I, I think, I think that's, you know, the, we're, the families who are kind of so-called reclaiming this agrarian way of life um, that w didn't grow up in it. I think that's our duty is to, is really to just jump, jump into a certain point, knowing that we're going to fail and we're going to make mistakes but we're we're creating like a, a way of life that for them it's like this is just normal and we're also acquiring capital whether it is through a desk job or you know a, agricultural i think to set the next generation up for a success and like and it just becomes you know this we're pushing this ball up the mountain and i think you know generation two generation three it just starts to roll you know and I think the one thing that can't be missed though is the love the love of it it's not this you know we're beating our kids over the head to get out there and pull the potatoes uh or weed the garden but it's there's a love and a joy and a celebratory aspect of it and that's the thing i mean you know we were out there last i guess two months ago and just seeing your kids pick up the instruments really on their own and kind of i feel like it just kind of culminates the whole thing of living you know this agrarian way of life where you're creating your own music, you're reading good literature, you're going to a good mass, you're eating good food and you have good neighbors. I mean, that's, I mean, that's not what we all want, you know, <laughs> I mean, send yeah, us back to, yeah. the, you know, it's, but it's, I, all of that, I think just giving them the opportunity to be exposed to it and, and, tr and then and you pique their interest. And then, you know, anything we could do to cultivate that, I think is, I guess that's where I see my, my, my purpose at this point, you know, at 40 years old, 39. Yeah just like 
No, it's it's liber it's it's liberating when you put things. Um, I think actually that's a that's a good way to wrap this up. Is it's um, liberating to put things in their generational thought because there's yeah. a tension you always feel. I mean, and you know when you start homesteading, people are like, you know, I, I call it my uh, but you're not making blood sausage moment, which is you know we killed our first pig, right. and uh, of course, like any good millennial, we put it on the internet for all to see and. Um, the, someone said, oh, but you're not making blood sausage. You know, and my response was, well, how many pigs did you kill this week, you know, in the city? And uh, the, yeah. but the tension I'm, I'm mentioning is that you always feel like, ah, oh, I'm, I'm, I'm faking it. You know, we're not really living this. Yeah. Uh, actually, yeah. the reality is it's, you're not faking it. You're, you're having a, a cultural conversion within your home. And the, the thought that you can just make that happen um, yeah, overnight, you know, yeah. with, a, with a couple of savvy per, per purchases and you know some branding and some uh you know selfies with overalls on is is ridiculous but also when you're tending to the culture and even the interests of your of your children and and in a sense they are you know they're limiting because you're you're limited on the farm so you limit those and then you really right. nurture uh yeah our kids uh you know we have one uh you know Margaret Mary does everything we have one who's just he's really into making stuff with metal i mean most likely he will you know he, he loves blacksmithing and all that and then and the younger ones they all you know there's pigs on the farm right now for the first time that i don't own any of them the children own all the pigs right now uh yeah the cows are yeah. making back off but um but to know that all right this capital that we're converting uh that we're gaining as much as as in whatever way we are to convert it to a way of life towards our children is really is a reasonable goal and that's that's something that um that makes a lot of sense. So, um, yeah, I think on yeah. that, uh, I'd like to, Tommy, we're going to have to have you back on cause there's tons of stories, uh, that I, that I know of, cause I know you personally, um, uh, and particularly all of our failures, we can, we can laugh at each other. <laughs> like I said, maybe, maybe that'd be a closing thought is definitely get, get a friend that you can laugh at each other with. Don't take yourself yeah. too seriously. And uh, yeah. you don't need to start a blog, but, uh, look, uh, Tommy, <laughs> thank you for being on the, uh, the till and keep podcast uh, i appreciate you and look forward to having you on next time this episode of till and keep has been brought to you by tan fraternus and sword and spade till and keep is a podcast that shows how the primordial command from god to adam to till and keep the garden applies whether you toil on a farm or in a concrete jungle visit till and keep podcast.com to subscribe and follow the show and use coupon code TILL25 to get 25% off your next order at tanbooks.com.